So I am Michael Neal. I was born in Shrewsbury, Massachusetts, and uh, my dad uh, ran a machine shop. And my life ambition at the age of five was to drive the forklift at his machine shop. And at the age of 17, no, actually it, was, it wasn't until I was 20, I finally achieved my life goal and uh, got, to, got to work for the summer driving the forklift at my dad's factory. Um, and then I went on to do, uh, moved to England, had a career as an actor. Uh, I'm theoretically famous in Wales, uh, for a show called Satellite City. And uh, then I got out of that and I write books and uh, raise kids and have a lovely life on the whole. On the morning of our 25th wedding anniversary, um, we were about to head up for a big getaway that we planned for almost a year. Uh, my wife got a call that uh, the mammogram that she'd had, uh, there was a problem with it and they were pretty sure it was cancer and, uh, you know, could we come in? So obviously we canceled the anniversary trip and it turned out she did have uh, breast cancer and it was a hell of an adventure. Uh, we, we, we talk about it, not a lot, but we, you, you know, this was back in 2015, so six years ago, almost to the day, actually, she had her surgery. We were <laughs> reminiscing, uh, a, you know, about a week ago. Um, but, but what was interesting to me about it, among other things, was that she had feared this since her early 20s. So like she, she you know, we met at 21, and uh, somewhere around the time that uh, uh, she had Oliver, our, 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 first, our firstborn, uh, she just started getting terrified of getting breast cancer. Um, and it was, it, it, it seemed so out of nowhere because we weren't aware of a family history at the time. It later turned out there was a family history that the family had never shared. But, but um, it, it, you know, we thought it was related to postpartum and, and something like that. And, but but it, 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 it got really bad and then it got better. Um, so that in a way, when it happened, what I thought was interesting is for about nine months was probably the least worried she'd been for 20 years. Now, as soon as it was over in the sense that she got the all clear um, you know, that there was no cancer left in her body, uh, she freaked out again. But I, I found it fascinating that for the, I'll say six months or so, that we were actively dealing with it was probably the least worried about cancer we'd ever been. Um, and that was, yeah, that was just kind of fascinating to see. How were those six months for you? It, it, it was interesting for me as the, I don't want to call myself the carer, as, as the husband of a woman I love who had cancer. Not really knowing what my job was, but knowing that my job wasn't to make the drama about me. <laughs> <laughs> like at no point did it look like this should be about me. Um, and, and I think the biggest learning I probably had was that at the beginning, I thought my, my job was to, to kind of keep her in good spirits. And the way that I knew to do that was to be reassuring. And eventually I noticed that my attempts at being reassuring were really pissing her off. Like she would get angry when I was trying to be reassuring. And, and, and finally, we, we kind of talked it out. And she said, look, you don't know. You keep saying it's going to be okay. You don't know. And I realized, well, shit, that's true. And I realized that my attempts to be positive, because they weren't true, I mean, I hoped it was going to go well, uh, it didn't help. 
and that actually what helped was being real, but being real turned out to be more positive in a way than we thought. So like at one point she was like, oh, uh, something, she had some pain and she was like, oh God, it spread, it spread, it spread. And, and, and I was like, look, you can't say that every new pain is the cancer spreading. And she said, it could be. And I said, well, okay. But by that token, if we're being real, and we were, I mean, it wasn't like hostile love if we're being real. It was just like, well, if we're being real, you gotta be open to spontaneous remission, right? Like, cause that's about as likely statistically as what you're describing. And that made sense to her. So in a funny way, what I learned was that reality was kinder than trying to be kind. And that was really helpful to see because it, A, took the pressure off me to be positive all the time because I mostly was, but sometimes I wasn't. But, but it kind of took the pressure off both of us because uh, we could just talk about it and we could talk about, yeah, God, it would suck if this goes badly. But we could also talk about it would be great if it goes well. And it, as it happened, it went well. And was there any point at which you were scared? Do you know, bizarrely, as a, as a lifelong scaredy cat, I think there were only two moments I can remember being scared in the whole sort of six months that it was really happening. One was right at the beginning. Not right, right at the beginning, because at the beginning I was in total denial, but... but that first day or two when we just didn't know what was going on, I, I found myself kind of getting lost in some dark imagining. Um, and then the actual day of the surgery, uh, so she had a um, double mastectomy and it was supposed to be like X number of hours and it was two X and nobody was saying anything to me. And so, during the actual surgery, the sort of not knowing what was happening, uh, again, I started getting a little lost in the, in the worst case scenarios. But oddly, kind of like I, was, I, I said that she had never been less worried when she actually was sick. Uh, I was probably had never been less scared mm. um, because it was just, there wasn't, it didn't seem like a good idea. It didn't, it sounds strange, but it didn't seem helpful. Tell me more about that. Well, I, I, I was aware that fear was going to happen, but it wasn't going to help. So the idea of being in any way involved in the fear made no sense to me. Like if I was scared, I was scared. If she was scared, she was scared. But scaring ourselves seemed like a bad idea. You don't need to make it worse, right? This is bad enough. Um, and, and so, you know, in a, in a way where that left us with, was with kind of a slightly dark, but really funny sense of humor <laughs> because it's like, <laughs> we couldn't stop the thoughts from coming, <laughs> but it made us laugh how dark we would get sometimes. Um, uh, and, and yeah, so it was like this it, 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 weird bubble. I, I remember, I remember Nina asking me if, you know, because she was terrified of being a burden, and I, and 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 uh, you know, I see this with my mom who's dealing right now with Parkinson's and rheumatoid arthritis and macular degeneration. I mean, she's fallen apart physically, and her biggest concern is about being a burden. Mm. And like we're all like, yeah, no, that's not your problem. <laughs> <laughs> like, and it was like that where Nina's biggest concern throughout the whole thing was that she was going to become a burden. Um, and I guess, I don't know, we never got this far, but maybe that if she was a burden, then I'd abandon her. And I, I don't know what the thinking was, but, and, and I, 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 by then was trying to be honest instead of positive, right? Cause we'd established that. And I realized that honestly, the only thing I found difficult at times was, was, her anxiety. I, I, we both dealt with reality really well. We were very clear. We got really quiet. We researched options. We listened to doctors. We 
both had the exact same sense of what was going to be best. Um, and we went with it without a lot of noise or it, it, it was like reality. We dealt with really well. Anxiety. We both struggled with in different ways. If somebody's watching and really struggling with their situation right now, or finding it difficult to cope or looking after a loved one who's struggling or feeling anxious, what would you say might be helpful? I think that, the thing that was most helpful to me during the, during the whole thing and after, because of course it, 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 you know, we were, we were having conversations about it last week, um, was recognizing that in no way would my working myself up help me help her. Uh, so, so it was this kind of weird thing of just recognizing at times I'm going to get worked up, but I'm, again, I'm not going to work myself up because then I'm not able to be there. And there were times when I wasn't worked up and I would watch her working herself up, scaring herself, you know, just kind of playing out scenarios where I could say surprisingly firmly, like, stop it. And it wasn't angry and she didn't hear it as angry. You know, she was appreciative of it. And normally I would never talk to her like that. But, but it was like, look, we never did this, but in, the, in, in every movie from the 1930s and 40s, oh, oh, and, and I get this is sexist, but a woman gets hysterical and the man slaps her and she calms down. It was like that, but without the physicality of it, and it was actually appreciated. Like I'd never actually understood, oh, there is something behind that. And it's not, I mean, she can smack me in the face too sometimes, helpfully. But, but there is something about having somebody there who isn't losing their shit when you're losing yours that's so helpful, who isn't terrified when you're terrified that's so helpful. Um, who isn't trying to make it better, but isn't making it worse. That's incredibly helpful. And, uh, you know, and then I would recognize, you know, when it did start to feel like it was about me and, you know, I did start wanting a, you, you, you know, there's a, you know, what do you want a medal? There were times where I was like, yes, please. Yeah, I know. I think I've earned it, <laughs> you know, but, but I also knew when that happened, okay, I'm not taking care of myself. And it didn't take a lot. It wasn't like I needed to go away on holiday. I, I needed to take an hour and have a nap sometimes. You know, I needed to get some work done when I should be watching. It, like, like, and, and so it sort of became that, that feeling that I was being a martyr and a hero kind of became my signal that I needed to take care of myself a bit. Um, and it really was, it was never anything big, you know, I, I, you know, what do you want a medal? Yes. Oh no, no, I want a sandwich. Okay. Go make a sandwich. Like, that was it. That, that was what actually was wanted and needed. I wouldn't say a lot of people ask us, but we've been asked multiple times is, oh, was it a gift? You know, was it, was, you know, the gift of an illness, the gift of, and, and people used to say that to me about depression. You know, when I used to suffer from depression, you know, oh, do you, do you see it as a gift now? And it was like, no way at all in hell, because I wouldn't give it to my children. Like, like a gift, you might re-gift, <laughs> right? There's no way I would re-gift it. But I would also say, I, I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy, but it was the best thing that ever happened to me. And I've talked with Nina about that, and she had a very similar sense it's not a gift. I mean, it's not like, oh, thank you. But, but man, were there a lot of gifts in it. And I think part of what made it oddly easier to bear was, was understanding the difference between our, our moment to moment experience of what was going on 
and some weird psychic ability to predict the future. So we'd get scared and we'd get caught up in imagining things, but neither of us really thought that was a sign that it was gonna go badly. We just know that you experience your thinking. So if you're thinking scary thoughts, you'll be scared. If you're thinking anxiety producing thoughts, you'll be anxious. And so it, it didn't look like a, 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 a portent of doom when we'd have a scary thought about the future. It looked like a scary thought about the future. It didn't look like, um, uh, oh, it's going to all be okay when we were in a good mood because we knew we didn't know, but it was nice to be in a good feeling. It was nice to be in a good mood. Um, you know, we also didn't try to stop ourselves because I think that, that was tempting at times. Oh, I shouldn't be happy. You know, my wife's got cancer. Must be happy. I was like, yeah, no, that doesn't make sense either. I'm not happy about that. But, you know, I think what I've learned through a life of, you know, suffering from and then dealing with and then moving beyond depression is that, you know, gr grab the good feelings when you can get them. Like the more the merrier. It, it doesn't make you a bad person to be happy when the world isn't the way you want it because the world will never be completely the way you want it. It, 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 it actually is easier to engage and stay engaged when you're feeling okay than when you're keeping yourself miserable. Like I remember when my, my dad was killed in a um, car, I say car accident, he was hit by a car um, crossing the street. And, and I remember for the first year feeling terrible if I didn't feel terrible. And I would... I found that if I thought about that he would never get to see his grandkids because we, we, you know, we hadn't had our first kid yet and he'd never get to see me make it and he'd never, I could make myself miserable again. And I, a, a, it really made sense to me at that point to do that because I thought that's what a good son would do. Fast forward 20 years later, dealing with this, and that looked like a terrible idea. It didn't look like it would make me a better husband to be unhappy all the time, to be scared all the time, to be miserable all the time. It didn't, it, it, that looked like a weird idea. Whereas I know when I was young, when I was in my early, early 20s, and my dad was killed, but it, that looked like a really good idea. And, and so that understanding that our, our feelings exist independent of our circumstances was so helpful to see in real time. My wife has cancer and I'm great. My wife has cancer and I'm miserable. My wife has cancer and I'm feeling goofy. My wife has cancer and I'm feeling scared. Right? The variable wasn't the cancer. The variable was my thinking. And, and that became obvious because the cancer thing didn't change. Um, similarly, <laughs> my wife doesn't have cancer and I'm happy. My wife doesn't have cancer and I'm miserable, right? It still doesn't change. <laughs> and, and so it, it took the pressure off needing her to get well so I could be okay. And then that took any pressure I might be putting on her to get well so that I can be okay. And I've just found that it's so much easier to do things when you're not under massive pressure. And that includes getting well, and that includes dealing with the possibility that you might not get well. Pressure doesn't help, I think, to know that you're, you're, you're loved, and to my mind, you're made of love. Uh, regardless of what happens. And then do whatever the hell you can figure out to do to make it better if you can. And with some things like this, you can't. And with other things, you can't. That's not in the cards. But 
either way, the pressure doesn't help. I kind of think in metaphor and, and one of the <clears throat> metaphors that was very much in my mind uh, throughout this, you know, I kind of say throughout this as if this really was only six months long. It, it wasn't. I mean, I started in her 20s worrying and it's continued after worrying less in some ways and more in other ways. But in the Lord of the Rings books, uh, which I read when I was, I probably was in my 20s. I, I remember being really struck by the way they talked about good magic and bad magic, white magic and dark magic. And uh, it, it, that, that white magic the, w was all about giving hope. And dark magic was about taking away hope. So the forces of dark magic would come in and cast their spell and the people would lose hope and they'd lose the battle. They'd lose the will to fight. They'd lose the, um, it, you know, they, they, it would just feel like there's no point. Like everything was lugubrious and heavy and hard. The, 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 the white wizard would come and cast a spell and people would start thinking about, oh, well, do you know what? Maybe this could get better. Maybe the circumstances don't need to change for us to have a, a, a better time. I mean, I, I have had so many experiences of talking with people who've gone through similar through support groups, but, but also quite different experiences who the last months of their life were the best, you know, and they'd always kind of confess it like, you know, don't tell anyone. But actually, you know, since I got ill, I've stopped worrying quite so much about what people think. You know, well, actually, since I've got ill and, you know, I, I'm, you know, I'm doing, I, I've got, I go to the movies during the week. You know, things that in my world, that's a, that's a big deal. But I got, oh, my God, you've finally given yourself permission to live. And, and so it's, it's. It's not just that there's always hope from my point of view in a positive outcome physically. There's hope in a positive outcome on a, on a feeling level. I always think of the feeling as being the soundtrack to our lives. So like if, the, if our lives are the movie, the feeling is the soundtrack. And, and so when I envision bad things happening, it is always with a horror movie soundtrack. In other words, I just imagine how awful I will feel if how awful I will feel when. And yet, again and again and again, life has shown me, I have no idea how I'll feel. And, and sometimes the very circumstances that I feared have happened, but the feeling was so full of love and peace and presence and beauty that it was hard to remember that that was the worst thing that I could imagine happening. Um, and so in a weird way, part of what's come from this is I've become a very sensitized to discouragement. Um, I'm against it just in case you're wondering where I stand. And, and, and I've really seen, Oh, discouragement is the enemy. It's not the cancer. That's, that's just what's happening, right? It's the fear and the discouragement and the hopelessness that'll get you. Um, and, and that hope isn't a promise that something good will happen. It's just living in the possibility. We, we literally don't know un until we really do. And funnily enough, I've never had any situation where I really know where reality scares me. I've had a lot of situations where I worry, because what if? But when it's a done deal, it's a done deal. And you just get on with it. So I, I've found that sort of really seeing the power of hope, but not thinking that I need to stay positive to have it. It's about possibility, not that outcome. But then also really, in a way, or even more so for me, seeing, oh, discouragement is what I got to watch out for. When that, when that 
starts dragging me down, that's my cue to, okay, I need to find a way out of, out of this thinking. Situation's gonna be what it's gonna be. This thinking's not helping in any way, shape or form. I think one of the things that I um, found interesting was a, 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 a few years after uh, Nina went through her cancer, uh, I had a warning sign for um, uh, prostate cancer. And it was really interesting watching myself have all these thoughts about not wanting to be a burden and not wanting to put my fears onto my partner and my family and, 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 and seeing it from that side and, and kind of going, Oh, wow. Okay. That's not nuts. Like that had seemed a little nuts when I was the carer. And then when I was the potential patient, I, that's immediately where my mind went. And, and so there, there, there was something about, in a way, like what, what got kicked out of me in a really helpful way was any degree of holier than thou that I might have had. Any idea that, well, I can handle this because blah, 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 blah. It was like, yeah, I don't know whether or not I can handle this. <laughs> now, ultimately, I do know because my not handling it would just mean getting really emotional and not being particularly helpful, right? It doesn't actually mean anything. It's just like, oh, okay, we can't count on him. Let's go to him, right? It, 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 I just next, next person up would, would step in. But, but it was really helpful to not put unrealistic demands on myself um, and to not need to be the hero of the story, saving the day, the, the good husband, the, the, um, cause that for me came with a, a sense of so much pressure that it was almost like it's on me to save her. And, uh, like I'm impressed if I change a light bulb, I'm not going to cure my wife's cancer, right? Like that's not my thing. <laughs> so the idea that, I'm going to save her with my positive mental attitude, or I'm going to save her by my brilliant knowing what to do, or I'm going to save her by being there 24 seven, or I'm going to save her by once I realized that, no, I'm going to do the best I can. And she's going to do the best she can. And it's going to have to be good enough because <laughs> it's all we got. And it just takes all that noise out of it and just lets you show up. Do your best. You know, you know, there's an old expression that, again, in these old movies I used to love, you know, smoke them if you got them, you know, where there'd be like, you know, it's like we're between battles right now, you know, so whatever, just do your thing. And, and I think that probably was learning that that's all I've ever got. Right. So if I can grab a, you know, a, a moment of fun, I'm going to grab the moment of fun if we can you know, squeeze in some stupid jokes and TV. We'll put that in. You know, if we're going to cry, we're going to cry. You know, we're going to cry for England. We're going to, we're going to be, and, and there's a beautiful line by the poet Khalil Gibran about um, love. I think we had it read at our wedding. But it, 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 the line that I remember is uh, that if you're not willing to love fully, you'll laugh, but not all your laughter. And you'll cry, but not all your tears. And I think one of the things that dealing with real life challenges has helped me with is loving enough to, to, to cry all my tears and laugh all my laughter. And that, again, I'm not saying the disease was a gift, but that's one of the gifts that came from it.